Hello everyone, this is another AWS Architecture Overview video, and this time we're going to be taking a look at a completely serverless application that is looking to apply rate limiting to its clients. That means there's also going to be a degree of authentication and authorization in order to ensure that the APIs are correctly throttling the different clients or tenants that are calling their APIs. And so this architecture is for a ticketing platform. It's for a company called SeatGeek, which is kind of like Ticketmaster or um, you know, those companies that resell tickets for concerts or uh, sporting events, things like that. Uh, and it came from the AWS architecture blog post. So if you're looking to kind of find that article, I'll put it in the link down below. Um, but I think it's a really interesting read and just looking at these different architectures that you wouldn't necessarily kind of come across in your day to day or different services you wouldn't come across is a really great way to broaden your skill set in terms of becoming a better developer. Uh, so let's take a look at the requirements really quick for their architecture. So there's only two. Uh, the first one is that they wanted a completely serverless application that has authentication and authorization. They wanted to uh, have a way to correctly identify who the client is via some kind of login software and also authorization. So to be able to say that you're able to call a particular API. So that's the first one. And the second one is that they wanted to solve this problem called noisy neighbor. And for those of you that haven't heard of noisy neighbor before, it's a pattern that comes up in multi-tenant applications that are sharing a fixed amount of resources. Uh, and before we go into kind of the components of the architecture, let me let me describe this problem a little bit more for some of you that may not be too familiar with how it works. So just go down here and make a little bit of real estate really quick. So assume that you have a uh, database here, right? We just have like some kind of standard database. If we click this, Okay, and just make that. And assume that you have like a, a bunch of clients, right? There could be um, like application clients. So C1 and C2, let's say, C2, right? And these clients are invoking, you know, uh, making an API request to your database, right? They're calling the, the database and they're retrieving resources, things like that. Now, the noisy neighbor phenomenon happens is that, say, for instance, client one gets a burst of traffic and hits this database really, really hard. That means that its resources are going to be consumed, which can impact the latency or the ability for your second client to be able to get results. OK, so this is called noisy neighbor. Now, the the way that people usually solve this problem is that they split it up and so they shard out their database. So they have like a second database and this is only going to be uh, kind of called by C2 and then the first one's only going to be called by C1. Or you have a scenario where you kind of have a collection of users that share um, the same database. And so that's one way to split up your, your usage so that you're kind of not all um, necessarily calling the exact same database and then introducing a single point of failure. This the same kind of process applies for APIs. Like if you just replace these two boxes with an API endpoint, then it's the exact same problem, right? You can uh, consume all the resources of that single um, point or that single um, failure point, and then it can bring down the application for everyone. So that's exactly what they're trying to avoid in this architecture. So we're going to get rid of that. Uh, so let's get back into the problem. And there's two distinct flows in this architecture. The first one is an onboarding workflow that they set up that allows the user to just basically get set up in their ecosystem. It creates a tenant ID or a client ID in Auth0, which is their authentication and authorization provider, or just authentication provider, I should say. Uh, and then there's an actual usage flow, which is when they have everything set up uh, and they're actually being invoked via their APIs from actual actual clients. So like um, smaller applications or companies that they're associated with that they provide API keys to that are going to call their API. And so let's go and talk about the onboarding workflow first, and then we'll get into the usage flow. Uh, okay, so onboarding workflow, what happens here? So Auth0, we need a bunch of uh, icons here. So Auth0 is going to be the authentication provider. So let's get that. Uh, we also need API gateway. That's going to be um, the API that they use or the mechanism to call APIs. 
And so that's the second thing. And then they also use a database. Now they don't actually say what kind of database this is, um, but let's just assume it's like DynamoDB or something. It doesn't really matter. Uh, any key value database will do. Okay, so you have these different components uh, that are gonna be used here. Let me actually just rearrange these for a second. So this makes a little bit more sense. I think we go in, in this order is what I'm gonna want. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the way that they describe this is that there's in this onboarding workflow, what they're basically trying to do is get the user set up with an API key in API gateway and also a client ID or a tenant ID in Auth0, right? So this is gonna be kind of uniquely identifying the particular tenant. Say it's like some small company that's associated with SeatGeek or Ticketmaster, the uh, ticketing platform provider, right? Because it's going to be machine to machine. So you have different services that are calling your service in this case. And so uh, they have this kind of workflow that they set up and we can just grab uh, some kind of workflow indicator here. Now they don't actually call out or mention if this is like a, an actual application component or this is like a person doing this, but there's a couple steps that they describe here in uh, the initial workflow to set this whole thing up. And so the steps that they describe are the first is that they need to create what's called a tenant ID in Auth0, okay? Uh, I've never used Auth0 before, so I don't really know exactly what that means, but I assume it's just some kind of like identifier to say like, okay, this is um, for a particular like user or something, right? Or a particular client. Uh, so they're saying create tenants, that's kind of big, um, tenant ID here. And so let's say that like you have TID, um, zero, zero, 001 is what they're creating, right? So that's step one. Uh, the second step that they describe is that after they do this is that they create an API gateway client key, right? Um, and this is gonna be used to um, uniquely identify um, who a particular client is, right? So that's the second step here. So create client key. And the, the interesting thing about API Gateway with client keys is that you can like apply rate limiting or usage-based plans to them, which is why this is important, right? So let's say that they created CID-001, right? And then the last thing that they do is that they create a mapping of the tenant ID to the particular um, client, right? So in this table, they don't give it a specific name, but let's just call it like mapping table, right? Um, they create mappings between tenant and client. So create mapping, mapping, and then they're going to say um, it's the tenant ID to client ID, which in this case would mean that you'd have something like TID001 uh, mapped to customer ID001, right? So TID-01 to CID001. One. And the reason that this is important is because later in the workflow, like someone is going to authenticate with the API gateway endpoint in the actual usage based workflow. And what's going to happen is that we're going to need to look up like what the uh, client key is from API gateway to apply the correct rate limiting plan so that, you know, um, if you're a client and I'm a client that are calling this endpoint for, for tickets, um, we can distinguish ourselves, A, and then apply the correct uh, rate limiting plan. So that's the, the whole idea of what they're trying to do here, okay? So this is the setup. The end goal is to get this mapping inside this mapping table, okay? So that's the, the entire extent of the onboarding workflow. Uh, okay, so let's go now to the usage flow, which is actually like using uh, the contents of what's in this table and also using the client key and the tenant ID. How does that work? Okay, so uh, let's assume now we have like a bunch of tenants, right? So like we have me as a, okay, I'll make that bigger. So um, we have me as a tenant. We can also have like a bunch of other potential users, not not users, but like other like clients, right? Like other applications that are going to be calling in that maybe we um, um, SeatGeek or Ticketmaster here has an affiliation with, and maybe this is just like you. Uh, I'm putting me and you like as people here, but these are just like uh, machines, like EC2 machines or whatever they may be. And so uh, what do we need to do here? How does this actual usage based workflow work? So the first step is that we need to call Auth0, right? We need to authenticate ourselves in this kind of flow. And so, okay, I'm going to do this for me, but it could be like me, you, whoever. 
every client is going to follow this exact same flow, right? So first we want to authenticate. I need to make this smaller because it's like way too big here. Medium, there we go. Uh, so we're going to authenticate ourselves, right? Typically when you're using like machine to machine application, it's like some private key, like something that you exchange offline, right? So we authenticate with Auth0. Auth0 is going to return back to our application some kind of token, right? Some kind of uh, token. And within the token is going to be, you know, there's a bunch of like standard stuff that comes within the token, but also within it is going to be some key stuff, including that tenant ID, right? Tenant ID, which in this case is TID-001. That's going to be inside the token that, you know, I'm going to, I can look at if I want internally, uh, but also I'm going to provide it later to um, the actual endpoint that we're going to, that we're going to want to call. Uh, so now I have this token in hand. So what happens next? Um, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to call my actual API. Maybe it's like get available tickets or whatever the, these things may be, right? So I'm going to call this API in this endpoint. I'm going to provide the token and also whatever the like params are of my API. Maybe it's like the date or the concert venue or whatever it may be, right? So like API params. It doesn't matter. Like for every API that they host, they're going to be doing the same thing, um, but it applies for all APIs. Okay, next what happens is that with their API gateway, there's a feature called a authorizer, okay? So auth or I guess lambda is what I'm looking for. Uh, and it's called a custom authorizer. And what this allows you to do is that when someone calls your API gateway endpoint, um, before it actually calls like the, the backend resource, maybe you ha actually have like an EC2 instance or ECS, or maybe even another Lambda function, but it invokes this Lambda function before it ever gets to whatever, like, you know, is going to be doing the work to retrieve resources or call another service or whatever, right? Uh, so this is, is what we would call a custom, oh man, that's a huge again, custom authorizer, okay? And so they associate this um, with the API gateway endpoint. So now anytime someone calls this, uh, what's going on here? Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, so anytime someone calls this API gateway endpoint, we're going to invoke this authorizer and you also get as input whatever is provided to the API, right? You get the token and the API params. Now, the whole point of this custom authorizer, by the way, you can use Cognito as well. And this integrates like pretty seamlessly. But since they're using uh, Auth0, an external non-AWS provider, they have to do a little bit of work around to get this to work. But anyways, uh, the whole point of this custom authorizer is to ensure that whoever is calling this API gateway endpoint is A, actually allowed to call this API gateway endpoint. They're not just some like random rogue user that got access to the URL by looking at like your XHR requests in the network tab or whatever. Uh, and the second is that they want to rate limit because remember that there can be like other people that are calling into this API and we want to prevent this whole no noisy neighbor problem that we talked about in the beginning of the video. So we want to apply some kind of rate limiting at the actual API level to prevent this whole phenomenon from happening, right? So that's why the custom authorizer in combination with API gateway are here. So this is the, I guess this is the first step. Maybe I should like mark these or something, right? So that's step one. Um, this is like step two invoke the API, right? And then this would be step three, which is like invoke the authorizer and what happens next. So now we have the token and API params in hand in the custom authorizer. And so we are going to um, retrieve the validation keys from Auth0, which we're gonna use to validate this token that's getting passed in. Remember, this stuff is being like forwarded along into um, the custom authorizer. So this is all in hand, right? So retrieve, oops, retrieve validation keys, right? And this is number four in this flow. And so they retrieve these keys from Auth0, that's fine. And now like within this authorizer, now we have the validation keys, we have the token, we have the params. One thing they do is they cache these validation keys because they don't really like expire very regularly. So that's one little piece of optimization that they did. So the next step is to do like this internal logic where they like, can I like, yeah, point to myself here. There we go, that's pretty cool. Um, where they validate the, um, the token, right? So they validate the token, validate, token to ensure using the validation keys to ensure it's not like from some random user that you know doesn't really have a valid token and so if this fails like if you fail the validation then the whole thing fails and you return everything back to the user we're done we don't do anything else right 
Um, so assuming that this token looks good, that it's valid, and that um, you know the, the, we val validated the signature and everything is completely fine, uh, then what happens is that we need to get a hold of the um, API key, right? Or the client key that we talked about over here, right? CID001 that's associated with API Gateway because that's what's used to actual actually rate limit the user. Um, so in order to do that, what happens is that we need to look into this mapping table, right? So I'm just going to grab this from over here if I can. This is all being done in the custom authorizer. And remember, in this mapping table, like inside of it, we have this, right? We, we have the mapping of tenant ID 001 to customer ID or C, client ID 001 rather. And so the next thing this authorizer does is it retrieves this mapping because remember, it has the, the token in hand and the token contains the tenant ID which is 001 and the whole purpose of this table is to contain the mapping so it calls like get me the um, retrieve row that with the key tenant ID 001 it gets back customer ID 001 right so that's the response it's going to be um, CID 001 and so now we know um, we have in hand uh, everything that we need. We know that the API key or the client key that API Gateway should be applying now um, and apply that usage plan to it, right? And so after this authorizer returns, like if it returns successfully after the validation, actually, let me just put a uh, like a five or six, I guess the sixth step. Uh, the seventh step would be after it's done, like assuming that everything worked, it would return back with an OK, like anytime um, it succeeds at the authorization step, it's just going to return with a non-exception, which means that, you know, it's fine. And then it's going to apply the rate limiting rules, apply rate limiting rules. And this was, remember, set up as part of the onboarding workflow, right? When we created the client key, I don't think I actually mentioned this, but they associate some kind of usage plan with a particular client. I think in their case, they had like a sil or a bronze, silver, and gold, which is probably equivalent of just like, you know, 10 requests per second, 100 requests per second, 1,000 requests per second. However, you want to set that up based on the API Gateway usage plan, right? And so after they return this back um, to API Gateway, API Gateway is now able to apply the, um, the the rate limiting for you. And so this allows you uh, to prevent like, you know, if, if I'm calling this API like tens of thousands of times, um, I'll just automatically get throttled in the case that everything is working. And then uh, like conversely, you'd be able to call this API. And because I am getting throttled from API gateway, your APIs will be able to uh, invoke successfully. So they do a couple other uh, optimizations here. They cache the mapping between the uh, IDs here, the tenant ID and the customer ID within the the Lambda function itself uh, so that they don't need to look it up in the database every time. So that's one small little optimization that they do. Uh, they also va uh, cache the validation keys as well. So they don't have to call auth0 every time to go ahead and get them. So that's another little optimization that they do. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the solution of what they built here. And then, you know, um, this API gateway after everything is done, after step seven, this can then go on to call like the actual uh, resource. Like maybe it's like a, I don't know, like some ECS cluster that's like, get me the tickets that are available. And then like this thing calls some other database that like has tickets and, you know, all the stuff that you would normally do. Uh, and everything is fine. Everything is rate limited. And this thing is now protected from, you know, someone kind of uh, browning out your database with a bajillion calls. And so in terms of some of the like benefits or some of the, the things that they accomplished with this architecture, um, first one we can say is that um, like easy auth, right? Easy authentication flow uh, using auth zero. So they're able to achieve that um, through this token exchange thing and also the mappings between the keys uh, so that they can apply that rate limiting. So they set that up. Uh, also like auth author authorization, uh, we can say that as well. Um, the second one is in terms of caching. So they added like some optimization here in order to ensure that like um, the, the auth flow is happening pretty promptly. 
Uh, it's also um, like completely serverless, right? So it's completely serverless. So this thing will scale uh, pretty much. Um, you can throw any number of requests at this and API Gateway and Lambda will be able to handle it or scale up. You may get into some bottleneck situations down here, but they don't really talk about this in the architecture. Uh, and then the last one, oops, what's going on there? Uh, the last one is that they solve the um, noisy neighbor problem. Uh, neighbor with... Uh, rate limiting, rate limiting. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what they were able to achieve. Uh, can I zoom out? There we go. Um, with this architecture, with this ticketing platform, uh, contains two distinct flows, the onboarding flow and the usage flow, but it's a pretty neat application of rate limiting and integration with another provider besides just using uh, Cognito, which I think most people on AWS do. But yeah, this was another AWS architecture overview video. If you enjoyed it, please let me know and like and subscribe and do all the things. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.